Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll go ahead and grab your seats, we're going to go ahead and begin so that we can give our speaker as much time as possible today. Um, we are delighted to have with us this morning, and those of you who are at the early service, you were blessed to hear him already. Those of you who are coming to the later service will be doubly blessed um, because you're hearing him now and you're going to hear him again. Uh, but we have with us one of my dear friends and somebody that I have read and learned from over the years, uh, Dr. Ken Boa. I'll just give you a brief introduction so he has as much time as possible this morning. Uh, as I said to the 815 crowd, Ken Boa is just an extraordinary individual. There's hardly a subject on which he cannot converse and converse with authority. And you're about to discover that. Um, Ken has uh, a Bachelor of Science degree from Case Western University. Um, he has a Master's in Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary. He has a PhD from NYU, and just as though that weren't enough, he went on to get another doctorate of philosophy degree uh, from Oxford University. So um, he really is a polymath. There's hardly anything that he cannot, as I said, converse on and do so with great authority. But one of the things that Ken has an uncanny ability to do is to take complex ideas, difficult ideas, high ethereal theological concepts, and bring them down to the practical level and show how they really make a difference in our lives. So without further ado, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Ken Boa. He, he mentioned Case Institute, it was actually Case Institute of Technology. I'm so old I was there before it became Case Western Reserve. But, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a generalist, I'm not a specialist, and I'm, I'm a philosopher of science, and I'm now using creation as a force multiplier for awe and worship because we're immersed in wonder and splendor. We're even working on a museum of created beauty, but that's another subject. I just love the beauty of God, and you are immersed in it, and what a time to be seeing the glory of God with the spring palette and all kinds of wonders. I have a, my associate, Cameron McAllister, who is with me. And Cameron and I are a lover of many things. We love beauty and goodness and truth. Love film. We talk a lot about, uh, about that all the time. I read him a story last night from Edgar Allan Poe. Um, so we kind of have all kinds of common interests as well. Uh, would you just introduce yourself, Cameron, briefly to us? And uh, this is, he is uh, now a ministry associate with Reflections Ministries in Atlanta. You just say, yeah. Yeah, you come up. Thank you very much, and it is lovely to be with you at your absolutely magnificent church. I was just admiring all of the architectural wonders. So, and thank you so much for your hospitality. It's been a real joy already. And yes, it was funny. I, was, I called my wife last night, and I said, well, Ken is going to read me a story tonight <laughs> by Edgar Allan Poe. And so my only request was, please don't make it too scary. <laughs> But thank you so much. It's great to be here with you. One of the things we're involved in is what I call a fourth soil ministry. And by that, I mean the, the soil that was the good soil that lasts. And I, it's an intergenerational ministry as well. And so Cameron is helping us process what that looks like in terms of cultivating things that will, are going to endure forever. But you're, I'm going to be speaking about identity about purpose and about hope, and just have a few words on that and open it up for interaction with you as well. So I start with identity because it relates, relates to the question, identity, who am I in this world? And many people are not able to really answer that question. If Imagine, for example, you went to a party, and you know that they have hello, my name is, all those tags there. And so you go up to someone, and his name is John. Oh, hello, John. Now, this is a thought experiment. I'm not recommending you do this. Hello, John, tell me, who are you? <laughs> That's not what they expected. What would they, how, would, how will John answer? He'll tell you about his job. I'm sorry, John, I didn't ask you about your job. I asked you who you are. Then he might tell you about his family. Sorry, John, I didn't ask you about your family. I asked you who you are. He might tell you where he came from. I didn't, you're making yourself so socially odious, by the way. They want to get away from you very quickly. But, Press it further 
and maybe one or two other questions until finally the guy is utterly clueless because he's built a false self based on having and doing and not on being. I can tell you who I am in one sentence, and there's many sentences that could be amplifying this. I'm a child of the living God. That has to do not with doing. It doesn't have to do with, with having. It has to do with being. And it's going to be true for you in all the seasons of your life, all the circumstances of you like, your life. You know who and whose you are. So that thought experiment is a good one, isn't it? Because people haven't really constructed a real sense of who they are. There's a story about the American playwright Arthur Miller that illustrates this a little bit as well. And he was sitting alone in a bar, and Miller was approached by a, about a, a well-dressed but slightly tipsy fellow who said, who said to him, Hey, aren't you Arthur Miller? And then he said, why, yes, I am. Don't you remember me? Of course he didn't. Um, well, your face seems familiar. Why are I'm your old buddy? Sam, we went to high school together. We went out on double dates together. I'm afraid I, I guess you can see I've done all right. Department stores. What do you do, Art? <laughs> uh, well, I, I write. What do you write? Plays mostly. Yes. Uh, would I ever get any produced? Yes, some. Would I know any? Well, perhaps you've heard of Death of a Salesman. Sam's jaw dropped. His face went white for a moment. He was speechless. Then he cried out, you're Arthur Miller. <laughs> but he didn't know that the playwright was the same as this Arthur Miller that he grew up, grew up with, you see. So he did not know the man's real identity. He had a different self, a different understanding. And like a man who has forgotten his name, we know ourselves and each other in a superficial way, but we don't grasp the who and the whose I am. And the only way you're going to have a proper built-in identity, an understanding of who and whose you are, is to allow God to define you. And let me give you a, dis a definition of that, uh, a description of, of what that looks like. Here is who you are. In Christ, you are an overcomer who has been adopted into the family of God. You're set free from the bondage to Satan, sin, and death. You're called and equipped to accomplish an eternal purpose that will have enduring results. Further, you're raised up with Christ and you're partakers of his life. You're sealed, you're anointed, you're indwelled and empowered by the, by the Holy Spirit. You're recipients of an imperishable inheritance reserved in heaven for us. We're members of the body of Christ and our joint heirs with him. We've been chosen, redeemed, forgiven, set apart in him. That's a pretty impressive list. You've been adopted by the family of God, the, out, uh, in the, the family of the living God. He's given you a new definition of who he's redefined you. He's in adoption, if you know the Roman ceremony, and if you saw the 1959 film version of Ben-Hur, you'll remember that Quintus Arius, um, actually who was rescued by Ben-Hur, actually adopts Ben-Hur as his own son, to replace the son who he once had, who was lost. And there's a marvelous moment there, because you see in a Roman adoption ceremony, the person would be, have a new background, a new, he'd be, be given a new name, he'd have a new heritage. He had, not only did he have a, the, the, a new past, but he'd have a new present, and that he'd have a dignity as, an, as a person who has been given all these uh, rights and titles. And then he has a new future, because he's an heir. And so you too now have been given a new past, a new present, and a new future. It's an, crazy, an incredible concept. I think of it, though, as this. Our problem is most of us, we don't believe those truths about ourselves. Do you really feel that you're chosen by God, holy and beloved? Do you feel that you're dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus? Do you feel that you're seated with him in the heavenly places at the right hand of the Father? This is a very mysterious thing here. You see, you're a spiritual being because you're a bearer of the image of God, but you also are an earthbound being. You are, in fact, an amphibious being. You are a spiritual being having this very brief earthbound experience. And then this is a soul-forming world in which you're being prepared for your eternal destiny and your eternal home. So to see it that way requires a good deal of faith. I define grasping God's identity for me 
that I'm holy and beloved, that I'm uh, known by him, I'm received by him. I have a whole list of these, of, of these, of these attributes of, of God that are uh, quite astonishing when you think about them, that you're a branch of the true vine, that you're uh, you've been called to be a saint, that you are a, temp a temple of the Holy Spirit, you're a new creature. And I believe this, that to, to, to really love yourself correctly, to see who and whose you truly are is to choose to allow God to define you and not the world, not parents, peers, and society, because that's too fragile a basis for being. And here's how I define it. Choosing to believe that what God says about you is true in spite of your feelings and experiences to the contrary. He says you're dead to sin. You don't feel that way. He didn't ask you to feel that way. He said, choose to guard yourself and present yourself as God presents you. And the more you choose to acknowledge that, the more it becomes real in your experience. And so you are in a training world in which you are being trained in this passing world for your eternal citizenship in heaven. He has great purposes and plans that are beyond our imagination. Joe Lewis, remember Joe Lewis, world heavyweight boxing champion? Uh, from 1937, until he retired in 1949. But he went as a GI, he was in the army. And so during that time, he was driving a, a, a truck with a fellow GI and he was involved in a minor collision, uh, a, a Jeep rather, with a large truck. The truck driver got out, yelling and swearing at Joe Lewis, who was still the world heavyweight boxing champion. You <laughs> understand what's going on here. And he says, and he, he just, Joe just kept smiling at him. He didn't respond. He just smiled until the guy vented his spleen, and then he went away, leaving his friend in the Jeep to ask the obvious question. I can't believe it. Why didn't you knock him flat? One touch would have done the trick. He says, and I love this. Now, you have to know about Enrico Caruso at this time was the great operatic tenor, and uh, everyone knew him. He says, why should I? If somebody insulted Car Caruso, did he sing him an aria? Not bad. Let me suggest to you that Joe knew who he was and he didn't have anything to prove. You see, I'm claiming the more you allow God to find you, the more secure you become, the more significant, and the more satisfied you become because you're allowing him to define you, not the world. You see, the world will define you by default. Don't do anything. It'll, it'll tell you what to pursue, what the price tags are. But the word of God will only define you by discipline. You must choose to show up and to renew your mind because this world is so much with us that we will lose our perspective in this fallen world. So the idea of having nothing to prove, you see, we get mixed signals like Charlie Chaplin. He, was a, he actually entered a, look -like, a, a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest in Monte Carlo. And, and he came in third. So we get, we get a lot of mixed signals, don't we, about, about our identity and what life is meant to be about. We, the, who am I? These mixed signals. So you need to choose who's defining you, you see, and allowing yourself to be engulfed in the truths of God which will slip through your fingers unless you constantly renew them. Again, we're in a soul-forming world and we're being prepared in this brief time, this ephemeral time, for eternal citizenship in heaven. And that who we are in, in Christ is not shaped by what we do, by he, what he did. The world says you're defined by what you do. And it has a way of asking this question when you retire. What have you done for me lately? Are you a cipher now that you've lost that identity? If you based your identity on those external things, it's not secure enough. It's too thin a veneer to allow you to have a robust walk in this world, that you are a new being already, you're seated with him in the heavenly places, though you may not feel this way. The more you begin to train yourself to realize you're an amphibious being and you can become conscious of his presence even in this earthbound arena. And the more you begin to see things as God sees you and to, be, and to renew your mind, the more it becomes real in your experience. You see, because you're a new being, but you're also a becomer. And our mission in this world is to become more and more in our practice who we already are in our position. And that is a great uh, vision of what life was meant to be about. A a word, that's a word about identity. Who am I? Fundamental question. Another question we've got to ask is purpose. Why am I here? Again, the fundamental questions of life, people have an incredible ability of averting and avoiding. 
for sometimes decades until maybe they're forced to ask those questions when they un unwillingly go to a funeral. But I, I say that the, that the coffin is more of an evangelist than, 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 the, than the cradle because the coffin reveals our true destiny that we are in fact ephemeral, transitory. And this world is so brief that we want to live in light of that understanding that what our purpose is, to grasp that no, you are here and you are here to pre and prepared beforehand for good works which he prepared before that you would walk in them. In 1905, Meyer Kolbensky was a Jewish Russia, immigrant from Russia. He gave his son a violin for his eighth birthday. It cost Meyer $50, which is a fortune in those days. And the son loved music and was soon playing well enough to give concerts at the Barrison Theater in Waukegan, where the Kolbinskis lived. And one night, as Benjamin, his son, uh, was playing, he felt impelled somehow between numbers just to tell the audience about a funny incident that had heard, happened to him that day. And so he uh, did, and the audience laughed, he said, and the sound intoxicated me. And he, that laughter ended my days as a musician. Jack Benny, as a young Kolbeski later called himself, had find, found his rightful career. Very few of us do that. But I think of your purpose is an unchanging reason for being, and I believe that God has called you, and he's known the number of days that you'd have even in your mother's womb, and he prepared them before you. And our call is to walk in that. And only if you would obey me, trust me, learn from me. You'll never understand me, stop asking why. You can't understand anything. If you can't understand anything in the natural world, and I'm more and more a big, big believer of that, you can't understand a leaf, let alone an insect or a bird. You can't understand a molecule of water. Consider a cell, that if a, a one of your cells, 100 trillion cells, were expanded to the size of Charleston, it would be more complex than that city. We can't get it. If I spoke to you of earthly things and you don't understand, how would, it, uh, how would it be if I spoke to you of spiritual things? Stop asking why, and God told Job, instead of asking why, ask the who. Trust in me. And the more you, you can trust him, but you'll never understand him. But you see, God is easy to please, but impossible to impress. So if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> if you want to hear him laugh even more, tell him what you know. We know nothing. We don't know squat. Why is this happening? Even if he told Job 77 questions that he's asked, and not a one of them dealt with his pain. They said, the issue is not that. The issue is who I, you are to me and who I am to you. And finally, when he came to realize that he hasn't got a clue, that he would, but you can trust him, although you'll never understand him. So I believe that God has got us here for a purpose. Each of us uniquely reflects and refracts the glory of God in a way that no one else can quite do. And you are unique. Just as God loves and treasures diversity, um, in my, one of my rooms in this virtual museum of beauty will be, the, of course, a Beatles room. Uh, because God's particularly fond of the things. And he's made 350,000 species of beetles. So uh, that's an inordinate fondness for beetles, it seems to me. But the more you look at and by species, you mean that it's distinguishably different from this kind of beetle to another. I have books of these things, and I marvel at their wonders because we haven't got a clue, and each of their compound dyes is unique to that particular beetle. They can't re reproduce and transfer to another. The more you look at it, the more astonishing it becomes, the more ravished you are by the wonders and why God loves diversity and creativity. Because... He wants you to become just as unique as a snowflake or unique as, as a flower in that world, to flourish and to have a purpose that you would glorify God by walking in his presence, obeying him, and coming to become like him by obeying him and by walking and taking the risk of trust. You see, because to know him, to, like to, I'm thinking about John 15, if you put these thoughts together in the upper room, he said, effectively, the key to um, glorifying the Father, we'll start with that. What's the key to glorifying the Father? Because you've been called to glorify, by, by this you will glorify the Father that you bear much fruit. So if fruit bearing is the key to glorifying the Father, what's the key to fruit bearing? He says it's abiding in him, because the branch can't create life 
You were never meant to create life. You can only receive and reflect his life. Here's the genius of it, though. The, indwell, the, the incarnate word is now the indwelling word. And his life is in your life. So as you receive his vitality as a branch, you become a conduit to that. And in fact, what happens at the end of the branch, let's say if it's a fruit-bearing tree, it, it bears fruit, but the branch doesn't need the fruit, and the fruit has two qualities about it. Number one, the fruit has the seeds of its own reproduction, and number two, it nourishes others. So evangelism and edification. You see, as you abide in him and let his life manifest himself in you, here's the beauty, that you will uniquely express the glory of God in a way that no one else can do. And that's a wonderful thought. You have a unique purpose, and God's desire for you is to be fruitful and to multiply, to walk in this world. And one of the things that I'm struggling with in this world is, as things seem to be falling apart is this real reality. I want to be known more for what I love than what I'm against. And I want to pursue beauty and goodness and truth in a time where that's being lost. And so rather than cursing the darkness and wringing my hands, we're seeking instead to woo people and draw people into those realms of beauty and goodness and truth. And that is a, the way we ought to be um, in that very real sense. Another way of looking at a purpose, one of my favorite films to teach, I like to teach films because a film points beyond itself, especially if you can pull up moral and spiritual themes and use that. Carrots of Fire is one of the films I teach. And you'll all probably be familiar with it. It's a film that transcended its actual makers because it was not really a Christian film, but it became one. You see, Dodi Fayoud was the producer. Um, it's a very interesting thing, and uh, Hugh Hudson, uh, all these people. Yet God honored his servant, Eric Little, the Flying Scotsman. And there's a scene, I love it, when he speaks to his sister, and she's concerned about him actually joining the mission society, uh, or running that. And he says, I've, I've decided I'm going back to China, he tells her sister outside, uh, outside of Edinburgh. The mission, uh, missionary service accepted me. And she's thrilled with that. But then he says, but Jenny, I got a lot of running to do first. You see, I, you've got to understand, God, I believe God made me for a purpose for China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Ask yourself this. What is it that you can do that when you do it, you feel the pleasure of God? And if you don't know the answer to that, ask God to show it to you. He's here. He's, he's easy to please, impossible to impress. But you can please him. Even our faulting efforts will be pleasing to him. So this idea, what is it that you can do? Frederick Beekner in Wishful Thinking, a theological ABC, put it this way. I love it. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep needs meet. You're called to take where your deep joy, your deep gladness, and the world's deep needs, they intersect. It's not a call to a mis min min really misery, but rather a life of fulfillment, of other-centeredness, of seeing transformation, even in this world. So that I claim this, if you pursue satisfaction first, you'll never find it. I claim that satisfaction and significance and security are never found as ends in themselves. They are the byproduct of the pursuit of him first. To take the awful risk of treasuring him above all other goods. And to pursue him first and foremost, he'll throw the rest in. But if you pursue the secondary goods, you'll not only miss out on the primary, but you won't even enjoy the secondary. So he calls you to this risk of embracing his purpose, and you grow into your purpose. You see, you may have different careers, my father was a bus driver. He drove a bus for 42 years, I believe it was. Never had an accident. He went from New Jersey to the Port Authority Terminal. I don't know how he ever did that without having an accident. <coughs> Best driver I knew. But um, it, now people have multiple careers, as you know, different paths. But I claim this. You may retire from your, a career or a job. You never are called to retire from your vocation. A vocation is from the Latin word vocare, which means calling. God has a purpose for you. And your mission is to discern what that looks at this point in your journey. I have a book that just came out called Recalibrate Your Life. 
and it would not be a bad thing. You go to reflections.org and you'll find it. But I would love you to do that because all of us need to recalibrate and to revisit our lives and to make a mid-course adjustments so that uh, we don't go too far, far off from our direction. So there's this need to recalibrate and to have a sense of that. And ask God for a clearer vision of his purpose for your life. But then I go on to hope. Identity, who am I? Purpose, why am I here? Hope, where am I going? The past, the present, and the future. And God has given us a narrative, the greatest story ever told. I love to teach film and literature precisely because a story well told always points beyond itself to the greatest story ever told, you see. And it invites us to realize we're in a divine comedy. Dante called his great work Commedia. Not because it's funny, but because it ends well. Because there are four acts to this comedy in the creation where he's all, all began well, as a good comedy would. Things are going well, so you think tw uh, much ado about nothing or something like that. <clears throat> Midsummer Night's Dream, everything's going fine, and all of a sudden things fall apart. But it has a creation, then it falls apart. It's called the fall. And this fourfold alienation between ourselves and, our, and God, and ourselves and ourselves, and ourselves and others, and ourselves in the natural world. As Thomas Merton put it, we're not at peace with one another because we're not at peace with ourselves. And we're not at peace with ourselves because we're not at peace with God. He's got that right. The concept then is to get that oriented and understand your true identity, your real identity, is to allow him to define you. And the more that happens then, the more you discover your true self, your real self. And in doing that then, you have a sense of hope and purpose because he's called you here for a purpose. And he's called you to accomplish something that's going to last forever. The significance, because the measure of the importance of the thing may be well construed as how long will it last? And you go to a cemetery and you see names and they were beloved by those who knew them. Oh, he'll be remembered in the hearts of his friends, we say. <coughs> Woody Allen had a problem with that <coughs> when he was asked, do you want to live on in the hearts of your friends? He said it this way. No, I'd rather live on in my apartment. Because <coughs> <laughs> what good will it do if a million people are singing my praises morning, noon, and night, and I'm gone? You see? So... We want to, but we desire, we long for something that's permanent, but we know it's going to be ashes in our mouth and, and uh, emptiness, toys, trins, tr uh, tinsel, and, tr and trinkets, unless we pursue the things he calls us to pursue. So we have to recognize that there's a danger of putting our hope in this world for, for well, hope in Christ for our eternal destiny. And then we put our hope in the world for everything else. Because you see, that etern eternal destiny is too nebulous. I think most people have a hideous view of heaven. What I, by this I mean, what do you think you're going to be doing? Strumming a harp for, you know, after 50 years? What, is there anything else you can do? Um, so I, there's a Gary Larson cartoon, for example. A guy gets his kit. He goes to, he obviously gets his kit. And he's sent off in his little cloud. These crazy ideas you've got. And he's got, a, he's got his wings. Where did we get the idea we have wings? It's nutty. That's, it's it's a wonderful life. Clarence gets his wings. Nonsense. You don't get good theology from that. You're not going to be an angel. You're going to judge the angels. You'll be above them. No. Uh, but he, he's got his harp. He's got his halo and all this. And the, he asks this question, though, in the caption. Are there any magazines here? <clears throat> we don't have a good imagination. We need to cultivate a sense of godly hope and to put our hope in those things that he tells us to, woo, to pursue because it's going to be a great ride indeed. It's, you're being prepared for something that's beyond imagination. The world system will be overcome when the Lord comes. We know there's a decisive understanding because you see in the last act, that's when the king comes and he turns straight and things right and makes them right. So we are in a comedy because it began with, well, the fall, but then there is redemption, and he begins right now in time to um, unravel the works, the horrors, the death of the fall. But not perfectly in this world, but in anticipation of the new age to come, the new world, the new heavens and the new earth. And it's a comedy because it's going to end well. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. I think of heaven as endless creative activity without frustration to the glory of God. It's a process in which you will actually be freed from the bondage to this 
nonsensical world system that would, uh, which would seduce us by the cacophony of nonsense, amplified now in ways that have never been seen before by social media, and te people are now mediaized into imbecility. Uh, it, takes, it takes that much, and so people are losing a sense of identity even in the real world, and they're becoming lovers of the, analog, the digital more than the analog. And so to realize that's thin, uh, the flesh, this thing, why do I say and do and think, uh, think things I don't want to say, do and think? You ever have that problem? We all do. That will be decisively dealt with when you see Christ. Because when you um, die, which is the second birth canal, I see it that we will see him. And he will burn away, purge, purify, remove all those things that are not him. And so I, I'm terrified of that. But I long for it. Because then you won't be able to think sin. You see, it's easy to lip sync in the chorus of life. But each of us is going to have to so sing solo before Jesus. There's nobody to go around. So if I live today with only two days in my calendar, only, only two days I have today, I don't have yesterday and tomorrow, and this day is all I've got, let me treasure this precious present because I'm either going to invest it or squander it, but I'll never get it back again. And so if I live this day in light of that day, then I have two days because if, suppose I thought this was the world's last night for me. What, what impact would that have on me? So I, I'm encouraging people. I have a video um, uh, that you could find on uh, reflections.org called Cultivating an Appetite for Heaven. And I would love you to t look at that because it talks about getting rid of the, the devil and the demonic, and death, no more death, no more sickness, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. What will we have? Resurrected bodies that are beyond our imagination. And I'm now starting to see people as God sees them, as good as glorified. And it's changing my whole view of people. And so we will be dazzling in our beauty. Is that you? We'll say. And it'll be an astonishment, but also in a resurrected world where now time and space won't be our enemies, but they'll be doxological because they will now serve us like a kitten purring at our feet. You can use time and it becomes a medium of expression. Instead of taking your life away, it'll be a medium. It'll be, you'll luxuriate it in a, in a pool. And you'll never be in a rush again. And you'll have all the time you need to do that. Rather a pleasant thought, isn't it? Start imagining it. Because this is not fake. It's real. I'm not making this stuff up. It's real. And it is a divine comedy because it's going to end well. Now, this process then means that we'll be in a resurrected world as well, and that's going to be incredible because our experience of space and time. But an unbounded future in the, as gardeners of the new creation, which I rather like, that we will have an enhanced relational capacity. And so my hope is really in that which is going to endure. That, um, but a godly hope is, is cultivated and developed through adversity. That's why Paul says, therefore rejoice in tribul tribulation. Not because he's a spiritual masticist, but because of what it'll produce. <laughs> Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint. How many times have you put your hope in something that let you down? But here we have a hope that will be transcendent, that will be secure, it will not be corrupted, it will not diminish. How can I train people to prepare themselves for their true home, to see them as pilgrims along a very brief journey and to prepare us for that. How can I cause you to have a greater desire and a greater aspiration? Because as C.S. Lewis put it in The Weight of Glory, if, if anything, our Heavenly Father finds that our desires are not too much, they're too little. We're half-hearted creatures, feeling, fooling about with money, uh, drink, and, and, and ambition, like, like, an, like an ignorant child in a slum who's willing to go on making mud pies because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. We're too easily pleased. I know some people who are comparing their mud pies. I have a, a huge number of these mud pies. The other one might say, yes, but mine is of a greater quality. But it's mud. <laughs> And to put your heart in something that you know is destined to perish is foolishness. The smart, smartest thing you can do is to treat things according to their true value. Treasure them, and the world will give you the wrong price tags. And it's going to invite you to pursue things that will not end up well. 
But the word will tell you, here's what you pursue. Live a life of excellence and purpose, to treasure the things above. And the more you are heavenly minded, the more of this earthly good that you will actually do. So that, that suffering is re involved in this. You see, there are four kinds of people. There are people who have no hope. Uh, not, you can't live for very long without hope. Even Camus and Sartre, uh, they actually had secondary hopes that they put in, in a transitory meaning because you cannot live without hope. You see, the bi biblical vision of life is so rich, so robust, that a person who does not embrace a theistic understanding really is not capable of living in a way that's consistent with the logical implications of his own presuppositions. Only the believer in Christ can actually pursue that and find that is life indeed. So, you can't live without hope at the end of the day. The question is, why not commit suicide in many people's answer? And, that's, and we see more and more people doing just that. But rather, the second group is those who have a misplaced hope. And everyone, almost most people have some kind of a hope. But here's the problem. When you put your, 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 your hope in money, power, and position for your sense of self-worth and fulfillment, uh, you're going to discover, as countless others have before, that these things will let you down. Or if you, um, if you put the, your hope in your family, your possessions, or your social status to satisfy your longing for security and significance, you too will be disillusioned. So how do we transfer our hope? You've got to have a more uh, a rich hope than that. Then there's a third category, people who have the wrong, misplaced hope. There's those who have an ill-defined hope. They're not sure what they're really hoping in. Um, Bob Hope told the story about being in a plane that was struck by lightning. Do something religious, shrieked a little old lady from the aisle. So I did, he wisecracked. I took up an offering. <laughs> but it, true story about an Atlanta businessman who was staying at the Hilton in Las Vegas when it caught, caught fire. Interesting phenomenon, that. So he was asleep. He thinks, thought he was going to die. So he cried out to God to deliver him. As he later uh, reflected on this terrifying experience, he said, he put it this way, I didn't pray to the gods of work, money, golf, or family. You see, tribulation will bring about your true hope. That is why Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. What's the third part? And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. You are in a soul-forming world, and it will involve adversity because you then share in that fellowship and that transfers our hope from those things that are, that are paltry and thin to that which will endure and be satisfying. And so the only real hope, and I think God uses adversity and he uses times a few alternatives to bring us into contact with what we should have been hoping all along. And so the fourth kind of person is a person who has a proper hope. It's an unchanging character of the living God and I, I'm not called to to put my hope in anything else, therefore forgetting what lies behind and looking forward to what lies ahead. Don't allow the past to define the present. You and I are, have this living hope that we are not defined by the pain of our very bounded past. How long will your past be? A few decades max. You're not defined by that pain. And my view is that God will redeem, even in this fallen world, what he allows. He has a purpose for you that transcends your own. And he has a better idea of what your best interests look like than you do. And so, as I see it then, he calls us to re realize even the stupid decisions I've made or the malevolent decisions of others will not defeat God's purpose for my, for my joy. And so I claim then that there's a way of viewing this, that instead I am now realizing that he uses even the pain of the bounded past as material to actually transmute and transfer us so that we are people then who have a joy in an unbounded future, you see? So the pain of the past is actually preparing an unbounded joy for the future, and it's necessary for us to do that. It is a vision then of what life looks like, that uh, po the power of that eternal perspective in this temporal arena invites us to see life from God's sight and to see people as God sees them and to view them now with that in mind, to realize I don't have a clue what my best interests look like. I think I do, I don't. To let loose of that folly and to trust him because the more impressed I am with him, with Jesus, the less I am impressed with anything else. But then I discover again and again that if he is the wellspring of my desire, what do you seek if I seek that first? The other things are thrown in. 
so that the more I pursue what he calls for me to pursue, he's committed to my good, he's committed to my joy, and that is a wonderful thought. So given these thoughts then, we're no longer defined by our brief past, but our, by our unbounded uh, future. I'd like to open it up for some thoughts that you might have uh, on this, because they, it, living is a process, you're in a journey. And my view, for, before I open up, is that we are new, be you are new beings. If anyone's in Christ, what is he? A new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. Paul says, I no longer see Christ according to the flesh, although we did him thus, we do him thus no longer. If anyone's in Christ, he's this new being. But yet, at the same time, although you're a new being and you're a citizen of heaven, yet you're a becomer. And your call in this world is to become more and more in your practice who you already are in your position. So that you become, it's a journey of desire, and you're having, he heading to a celestial city in which all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. What, are you, what thoughts do you have? Yes. Oh, I love that, yes. The Museum of Created Beauty. I'm, Ken, you got three minutes to tell them about that. <laughs> oh, no. I'm sorry, you're right, yeah. I realize. Um, <laughs> how do I even begin? We're going to, here's what I can just say this. We're going to be using digital technology to romance people back into the glory of the analog world. And I'm going to show them the microcosm and the midicosm and the macrocosm, which in an age of increasing skepticism uh, against God, as, as people become less and less uh, enamored by the biblical vision of what life is about, guess what God does? He bumps up the evidence. And guess what he's doing it through? Science and technology. And it's going up exponentially. The more you learn, the more astonishing he becomes. So I'm going, it'll be a virtual museum that we're going to make available. Yeah. Let me just go ahead and close this with a word of prayer. We're so blessed to have Ken with us and just thank God for his ministry. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your grace and for your mercy and for this day, which is your day, the Lord's day. We pray that you would make our hearts fertile soil to receive the word that we have just heard, that it may bring forth in our lives the fruit of good living. Bless Ken Boa, Lord, and his continued ministry uh, for the way that he is able to challenge us to um, reorient ourselves, the way we think, the way we act, so that we are creatures whose minds are not fixed on the things below, but on the things above, seated with Christ in glory. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.